It says, now, social invisibility, that's the next term. The social invisibility of this risk means that unlike many other political issues, environmental risk must first clearly be brought to consciousness and socially constructed with recourse to scientific techniques as a novel sensory apparatus outside of our body, it's typical sensors. So it's only from the 1950s, and that's important to know, only from the 1950s that we have been able to measure parts per million and parts per billion. Before, we were always creating this kind of pollution, but we could not construct it until we had uh, mass spectrometry, uh, as well as gas spectrometers, which could measure small amounts. And we found that very small amounts of some things, like dioxin, for example, are terribly toxic. These are toxic, the parts per billion. But we didn't know that. So we introduced these things, and then we find out the social problems. So Beck says, the institutions that have created these problems, they can't solve them. We have to change institutions first if we want to have any kind of environmental improvement. So, the theory of history is hidden inside this risk society. There's three levels here. And I think this is very, very hard to justify, but bear with back for a minute. Um, he says there's a social progressive development and that each new kind of epoch of risk overcomes the previous risk through institutional adaptation. So he says, in a pre-industrial society, if you had risk, it was a form of natural hazards, and the spatial range was limited, um, you also had a cultural form. So here's the material, and here's the ideological. Beck is interested in materials and ideological and cultural interactions. It was constructed this way. You have natural risks, you have a culture of fatalism, where insecurity is openly visible. You see an earthquake happen. You see a huge tidal wave destroy your community. And on cultural terms, the risks were assigned to God, the risks of the fault of the environment. So the risks are not social, that sense. The risks were constructed as a natural problem or a supernatural problem. In the second epoch of risk, we began to have much larger levels of risk. He called these classical industrial societies, where the origins and consequences of risk change. Material risks and accidents now are to blame on people. They're contingent on human decisions and actions, individuals and wider forces, dangers of machinery, worksite, or local pollution, no longer solely attributable to external agency. You can't blame God for coal mining, you know, for instance. You can blame people. So risk politics begins to develop. And the cultural effect was we developed institutions that balanced these problems institutionally. Uh, industrial societies developed institutions and rules for coping with these socially created risks. Best examples of institutions um, were principles of rule or procedures of finding out fault and blame for pollution, legally implemented compensation, actuarial insurance principles, you know, a uh, pension plan for the coal miners, welfare states to mitigate work risks can be calculated because of predictable risks of work. Blame can be asserted openly. It's your fault, you're sick because of cold. Uh, statistical likelihood is calculated. And science, science is trusted. Science is needed because it is the process that creates the construction. So science becomes part of the system of trust. In the third section, he says, now risk doesn't occur in these clear areas, but it's the penumbra. Occurs everywhere. The material risks change. It's socially invisible. It's catastrophic, unpredictable, irreversible. So even if you found someone to blame, it's too late. I mean, we can blame people building a nuclear reactor. 
but it doesn't do any good to punish them. I mean, previously, you, but now it's just catastrophic. Kind of Hundreds of thousands of people will be hurt for many generations. It's just a totally catastrophic. Kind of so the material, and then the other side is the ideological or cultural. So Beck feels what has to happen is new institutional change will occur in the future. Cultural change, the past, self-legitimated rational procedures of blame, and the fact, are difficult to apply or pointless for the areas of pollution he looks at. Methods of perceiving risk and attributing causality, allocating compensation uh, have broken down. In doing so, they have thrown the functioning and legitimacy of modern bureaucracies, states, companies, and science into question. As they keep covering up, and they introduce those risks through the old-fashioned procedures. So they still keep creating. They have the same social institutions, but the material risks they allow are now totally catastrophic. And it makes no sense to trust these institutions anymore, like I said. Um, he says, now there's no certainty of blame whether the perpetrators called the justice ever at all has no guarantees of safety or protection. This is the mismatch of institutions that he talks about. Um, let's see, I'll skip these. What I want to show, um, Beck's choices for the future, what would the future institutions look like? Um, originally, he started with a very mild form. He felt strong, independent legal system, free media, widespread opportunity for criticism. But later, he says there's two paths to the future. One, there's an authoritarian technocracy. That means the nuclear powers still dominate and they reject any kind of control. Genetically modified crops are allowed to police themselves. And he sees this as an authoritarian world that continually creates risk. He, or, he says, 